Okay, hello, bonjour, and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Keefe, Business Advisor here at the World Trade Center Winnipeg. I would like to begin by respectfully acknowledging that this webinar is coming to you from Treaty 1 territory, a traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OJ Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the national homeland of the Red River Métis. Thank you for joining our webinar, How to Grow Your Business When Sales Hit a Wall, which will be presented to you by Drew Friesen. Before we begin, I want to share a few housekeeping items. Please send all of your webinar questions directly to the chat box at the top of your screen, and Drew will try to answer as many as he can throughout the webinar and during a Q&A session towards the end of the session. For all logistical questions, please send them directly to the chat box, and I'll answer questions as soon as possible. And you will also receive a PDF copy and recording of this presentation within the next week. And uh, now it's time to start our webinar. I would like to introduce you to Drew Friesen. Drew is a fractional CMO focused on providing marketing leadership for businesses in the agriculture and manufacturing space. With a focus on data and customer insights, Drew works to build a marketing strategy aligned with your business goals and then works alongside you to execute it with your team, leveling up your team along the way. Over the last three years, Drew has worked with businesses to create $23 million in marketing generated revenue and recouped and reallocated $150,000 plus of wasted ad spend. Welcome, Drew. The floor is all yours. Great. Thanks for having me, Paul. I appreciate it. Uh, today, we are going to go through some topics that for some may be very familiar and it'll be a different way of seeing it. And for others, it'll be a different way completely of seeing uh, the role of marketing in your business, how to measure it, what job marketing is very good at, and what maybe marketing struggles to do for you. Um, another way maybe we could view this is how you can use marketing to scale your business and what marketing can't do for you. Uh, like Paul said, uh, I'm going to be okay with, we're going to take little breaks kind of in between to allow room for questions. So feel free when questions do come up that you uh, put it in the chat and then we'll take a pause and we hit certain spots within the presentation and we can talk through it. Uh, this is not a sales pitch. Um, hopefully this is uh, this allows you to think a little bigger about what marketing can do and what it can't do, like I said. Um, and that you can use this as a way to filter what your team should be doing or the agency that you hire uh, so you ask the right questions and are looking for the right data. Okay, without further ado, first of all, let's get some context. So why am I talking about this? Is I help, like Paul said, manufacturers build an effective marketing strategy and then execute it with their team until they don't need me. In all the work that I do, it's I'm in a pursuit of understanding what makes marketing effective. And we'll talk about that today. So first off, I ate some humble pie over 2023, and it totally changed the way I see marketing. There are a ton of different differing opinions on what you should be doing in your marketing, what you shouldn't do. You know, is it as the SEO the thing? Is it uh, email marketing? Should we all be on organic social media? You know, is it LinkedIn or uh, should we be on TikTok? Uh, are billboards dead? You know, there's a lot of opinions on what within marketing, the marketing activities that we do uh, is worth doing and what's not worth doing and often are contradictory. So overwhelmed by the contradictory advice, I turned to marketing and behavioral science to understand what actually makes brands grow. Um, one of the kings of this is Byron Sharp, um, who literally wrote the book, well, um, How Brands Grow. And he's got a sequel now, and that's about, I don't know, 20 years uh, old-ish, maybe 30 at this point. Anyway, al alongside his empirical peer-reviewed research and many other papers, which I'll show here in a second, I spent, the number is probably a lot closer to 250, but uh, I spent a lot of time looking through some really dry uh, papers that understand how do people actually act in the market? Um, what within marketing really does uh, cause businesses to grow? And based on decades of science and math, we're going to distill that down to pieces that you guys can use uh, in your business today. We're going to talk marketing effectiveness. All right. Some of the sources here. Uh, I'm not going to talk through all of them, but Paul will make sure that everyone gets this presentation. You guys can look through. If there's a piece that you want to know about that isn't covered directly, uh, you can send me an email as well, and I'm happy to help uh, source something for you. All right. So what is marketing supposed to be doing anyway? If we zoom out, what is the role of marketing in a business? 
Today, uh, today the four P's have been split into four different uh, into different departments within a typical business. You've probably heard about the four P's. Uh, marketing, I think, uh, originally or traditionally was in charge of product, place, price, and promotion. These days, a lot of those roles, kind of deciding di place like distribution, what retail stores are we in, where are we setting up dealerships, what areas do we service, uh, the price of your product or service, and product innovation. Uh, are all kind of built into separate departments these days. Each business is different, uh, but that kind of has led marketing to be hyper optimized around promotion. Uh, this transformed the priorities and measurement tools of marketing departments today. Um, as you probably know, you know, in your business, you're not asking your your marketing department probably to set your price, um, though they probably should be weighing in on it. Um, but this has changed the primary objectives. Uh, that marketing teams have, and it's been much more about gathering leads or proving marketing return on investment to, pr to prove their value for the company, right? Unfortunately, this tends to be ineffective Whoop. because marketing is not sales at scale. Uh, marketing by itself does not produce revenue, and we'll talk about what it can do, but by itself, it doesn't produce revenue. It's not its own thing outside of your product and your sales. And uh, in terms of influence, uh, advertising has shown to be a weak force in persuading a consumer to buy. Um, marketing isn't there to sell, though it does make selling easier. Uh, instead, marketing is better utilized as a powerful lever to enable sales and product to be much more effective and efficient than they would be on their own. I think a better way to put it is that marketing is a non-linear multiplier of sales. And that makes sense, right? Like we're gonna we'll talk through a couple examples here in, in a second, but just to pause, um, marketing on its own isn't going to, you know, sell anybody anything. And often when you see an ad, if you think about, you know, browsing through social media, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, or whatever, and seeing an ad, you know, if you already didn't have a desire for the product or have thought about it already, especially the more expensive and complex um, buying decisions, you know, that ad is not going to persuade you to do something that you weren't going to do anyway or already thinking about it, uh, or it's uh, partway down that decision tree. Uh, so how does it multiply sales? You can, now each business is very different and there are many tasks within marketing, but you can kind of split the, the purpose of marketing into two large buckets. And uh, you know the, the experienced marketing strategist will maybe pick, pick some other, uh, nitpick this on me a little bit because there's some PR roles that marketing can have. But to keep things simple and assuming your marketing's job is to um, incrementally grow your business uh, and increase uh, revenue, there's really two large goals for marketing in a business, brand awareness and sales enablement. Now, remember we said multiplier. Spoiler is only one of these goals is a multiplier where the sales enablement is a one-to-one -one aid. Uh, most businesses focus their entire marketing department on aiding their sales team to close short-term deals. While sales can only reliably focus on accounts that are in market and one-to-one -one conversations, uh, marketing has a superpower that most businesses don't harness at all, brand awareness. So some practical examples of sales, sales enablement here would be building out great brochures, uh, pitch deck with your sales team, uh, running those buy now um, ads with some sort of promo discount code. You're filling your sales calendar uh, yeah, so your your sales yeah, has an easier time selling, sales enablement, right? And the majority of your market of marketing out there, if you if you think about and split the activities that your marketing department does or the agency that you've hired, uh, will split into one of those two categories. With the vast majority of the work you're doing being under sales enablement. So let's talk about brand awareness because I think it gets a bad rap. What is brand awareness? Well, first of all, let's think about brand. Brand is essentially the mental real estate that you have out there. Yeah, marketing in a weird way, actually, most of the work is in other, you know, your audience's heads. You can't really see it or feel it or touch it. It's not very tangible. It's the mental real estate out there in the market. And it's covered by all these things. Your market's perception of you, uh, how your customer service calls are, your salespeople interactions, emails that go out of your business, um, even the invoicing, estimates, purchase orders, quoting, uh, invoice bills, publicity, uh, other events, company announcements, et cetera, et cetera. All these things build up um, your brand, how how uh, your market thinks about you. Uh, so brand awareness isn't emotional fluff. It's about creating what we call mental availability. And so new term here, but we'll define it. 
there's kind of two big things that cause brands to grow. And this is straight out of Byron Sharp's book. Um, you essentially have mental availability, becoming familiar to your arc, your market, easily recalled and associated with your buyer's category entry points, which I'll explain in a second, or in physical availability, become increasingly easy to find, engage with, and buy from. So physical availability is probably the more uh, understood one. So I'll explain that one first. Physical availability, availability is you know, getting a new dealership set up so that now you can service North Dakota or uh, being in, now you're in Sobeys and now you're, you're drinkable, I don't know, coffee. I was thinking about uh, Sheepdog there as my example. Uh, now that's available at Sobeys and now you're more accessible for people who would not, um, otherwise couldn't buy from you. Maybe you now do delivery, you know, depending on your business model, there's all sorts of ways to increase physical avail availability. Uh, ones people don't think about in a digital world is being easy to find online. It would be another way of increasing physical availability. You know, do you have a Google business profile? Um, is your website easy to find if people search those the right keywords? And is your website easy to use in terms of to engage with? To me, that would fit under the physical availability part, even though it's not very tangible, right? If you're a direct to consumer business and you're selling shoes online or whatever, a lot of the physical availability is, can I ship to your location? And are you, am I, is my website and kind of my digital storefront easy to find, engage with, and buy from, okay? If there's any questions on that one, I'll, I'll take them. Um, the mental availability piece, this is really the superpower that uh, marketing has that most people don't utilize. Uh, mental availability looks like becoming familiar with your market. Remember, you don't need to take over the whole world. You just need to be familiar with the market that would buy your product or use your solution. Um, that you're easily recalled. People can think about you clearly. They know what you do, who you're for, and what sort of situations they should be evaluating your solution. And that's the category entry points thing. If you think about your category, let's say we're talking about uh, you know a storage solution. Um, the entry point for that buyer to that category, which is storage solutions, would probably be stuff like moving from their first home, or it's a business they bought a new manufacturing facility and they just stored into their new their product or their uh, supplies resources. Um, what is the category entry point? If you're a wedding photographer, category entry point would be someone just got proposed to, right? So each business has a different category that they serve or category of solutions, and your buyers enter that category in very specific ways. If you can associate your brand with the category entry points, the triggers, the scenarios that someone would be in to enter your category of solution, you grow. That's the mental, uh, mental availability part. Mental availability is created through advertising using ABL. Now remember, I'm just gonna go back here in a second. All of these steps create mental availability. There isn't just uh, only do it through advertising, but because I know that most marketing departments are hyper-focused around promotions and advertising, I want to show how you can do, uh, how to create mental availability through advertising. So I kind of, this is ripped from the B2B Institute, um, which is kind of a think tank lab out of uh, LinkedIn actually. Uh, around marketing effectiveness. And they use this nifty acronym as this is the three elements that need to be included for an ad to create mental availability. So ABL, A stands for attention, that it's actually grabbing their attention to be interested, to be interesting enough that they actually digest it. So if it's a video, not just scrolling on, uh, if it's on TikTok or Instagram or whatever, and that it's remembered. Uh, brand, that it's clearly you, and that it's clearly uh, you that's recalled. Uh, for, in, for instance, uh, something that's funny is when I, I audit a lot of manufacturers uh, and their advertising, it's it's often that they'll have created a great ad from an attention standpoint, and maybe they even have the link to category entry points piece, which we'll talk about in a second, um, but it's not necessarily clearly them. So they've, they've in, uh, increased the awareness of their category, but maybe they, they have, at the end of the ad, the person doesn't necessarily uh, clearly know that it was done by so-and-so brand. They just remember that, oh yeah, I should figure out what boat I want this year <laughs> or buying a cabin or figuring a storage solution or whatever, right? They don't, they don't necessarily clearly associate that ad and that uh, category awareness with your brand. And the last one is linked to those category entry points we were talking about. Associate uh, that this ad associates your brand with the category of products you're selling and the buyer's practical purchase scenarios. Advertising that hits this criteria creates the highest impact in the long and short term. And so we'll talk about what long term looks like, like how on earth do you 
know if you're doing these three things, if this is creating an impact for your business. We'll go there today, uh, time permitting. Um, but what is important to know is um, advertising like this, even though we're saying we're using the terms like brand awareness or mental availability, um, it is a long-term impact we're talking about. The, the best bang for your buck will be measuring this over the long period of time. But know that it also works in the short term. If you're doing this well and someone comes across this when they're in market and they need to make a decision and your ad is covering these three points, it still can influence uh, which brand they ultimately go with. So this is, this is the criteria I use when I'm auditing um, an advertising account or the entire media mix that a, a brand is, is working with on whether they're creating mental availability through their advertising. Uh, I'm gonna pause here. Any questions at this point? I don't have the chat showing up for me. Yeah, I've got it here, Drew. If there are no questions just yet, but if anyone right. has any, feel free to jump jump in um, or use the raise hand feature if you wanna chat. Uh, you know, not not typing through the chat functionality, but uh, I like the example you use there with the ABL in terms of, um, you know, they have the attention, they have the link to the entry point, but without the brand, you know, there's, you know, an issue people can't recall it. Do you have any other examples that maybe someone has the link to category uh, entry point and brand, but they don't have attention? Like what are the costs of them not doing, taking action on all the three elements? Like what would happen? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, it, it's pretty simple if you think about it. If you have a great branding and it links to their category entry point, maybe it's the scenario of, uh, for instance, I work for an alternative heating company. Um, you're linking to the scenario of their heating bills are too crazy living in a rural house and they need a different situation. You you you, you explain that and you do some storytelling to show that category entry point and you're clear branding. Well, if the video is dry, boring, uh, doesn't get to something relevant or tangible that would resonate with them and they don't even get through the first couple of seconds of the video, you have no attention. It doesn't matter how great your creative is. Like it really doesn't matter how <laughs> maybe scientifically correct your video is. If it's not being seen uh, and that's being digested and remembered and resonated with, it really doesn't matter. Uh, another piece to attention that I wanted to include in this framework, but I didn't want to get too nuanced, is reach. A huge piece that businesses often miss is maybe the, the creative will be interesting hits the, the attention uh, criteria, it's branded well, it's a link to your category entry points, but you're not putting money behind it in terms of the advertising, you're just posting it on your organic social media channel. Well, you're gonna get probably, well, you can analyze your own channel for yourself, probably in the hundreds of views, if that, maybe thousands, where if you put a couple bucks behind it and you really try to push it out to your, your audience, you can guarantee tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people see, or have the chance to see this advertising. So. Um, you may have these three done well, but if you're not reaching enough of your audience, it's really hard. Uh, it'd be really hard to make a real impact on the the growth of your business. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. So we do have a question from uh, James. So no mention has been made uh, regarding building relationships. Is this still a factor in today's marketing strategies? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I guess when we're talking about mental availability. Well, I guess it depends on what you mean by relationship. I think that, um, for instance, if you watch enough of somebody's content on YouTube or you follow a podcaster or something and you listen to their podcast for a long time, is that a relationship? Do you have a relationship with that person? <laughs> or or does that count? Or are you talking about, you know, that you're, you know, maybe the maybe the sales team has does a really good job of reaching out every couple months to see how you doing? You know, is there a problem you're facing that would make sense for us to to, to jump in and help you with? Um, it depends on what you mean by relationship. But um, yes, relationship does matter. What we're talking about here is almost the step before relationship. Uh, I like to use the example of zero to one. Often the biggest impact, and we're going to talk about incrementality here in a bit, um, that marketing can make is moving from zero to one, from being unknown by your best fit customer to becoming known by your best fit customer, right? That's the first step. Obviously, it creates another level of unfair advantage if they have some affinity for your brand, they have familiarity with it, they like what you stand for, believe in, but those steps are really after. And if we focus on those steps before we hit some of these critical building blocks that you're known at the very basic level by your audience, uh, and you hit the three criteria here on, on this, this slide, uh, then relationship is kind of a, a next step. And I also, uh, on that level, if you're doing this well, and people do think of you, they're essentially giving you the first chance. Uh, another good analogy here would be, 
if you're doing this well, you get to start halfway down the racetrack. It's like, it's like if you were racing, I don't know, NASCAR, and you get to start one lap ahead of everybody else because you, you're going to get to be in the first consideration for them before they do any other research. They're like, oh yeah, I know what brand solves this problem, so-and-so. You're in that first step. So they're going to talk to your sales team first. They're maybe going to check out your website first. You have that first chance for relationship. So every business is different. And if you're a business that, you know, someone will make a buying decision about it every week or every other week or every month, relationship definitely plays a bigger factor in it than if it's a buying decision that happens every five, 10 years. Um, and it does matter. But I guess what I'm speaking to here is that hit this first, then look at building relationships because the data on loyalty, which is not part of this presentation, but I've read uh, extensively, um, is that brand loyalty is not very real <laughs> in most industries. There's very, very few industries where brand loyalty is really a thing. And it's much more about risk mitigation. They're going to go with you again, not because there's some you know strong relationship, but because you're the least risky option. But uh, that's another can of worms we won't open today. Any other questions there, Paul? Uh, yeah. So just a couple of minutes ago, James had a little clarification. So yes, keeping in contact with a company that does not offer uh, sales immediately. So I think you alluded to a little bit of that. Um, we got one hand up here. Uh, is that a manual? Yeah. If you want to jump off mute there, ask away. Uh, thank you so much for the knowledge, man. I appreciate it. Uh, I just wanted to ask, like, so I know you mentioned the manufacturing. I also wanted to, I, I think I have two questions in one. So why do you think that a lot of like Winnipeg business owners don't see their business as a brand and want to go for that long term reach? Because those are the pretty much objections that I get in my business when I reach out to some business owners. They think a lot of short term thinking about their business. And what are those niches, like you said, manufacturing, where, you know, they understand the benefit of branding their business and taking it to the next level in a, in a long term um, in a long term game where people know them or are familiar with their business. I want to, I want to reach those amount of people. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I understand the, the question. Um, I actually think that B to C businesses, biz, straight uh, business to customer or business to consumer businesses, uh, actually have a better grasp and understand brand. I think B to B is, is far behind in terms of understanding how to invest in the long term. Um, we're going to go there. So I'm not going to answer this question completely because the, the next slide will probably hit home then for you. Um, but, uh, I think, I think one of the reasons why, if you're saying Winnipeg businesses don't think too much in, in terms of long-term investments or, or future cash flow, is it just feels less tangible. And when you don't have, you know, maybe a framework or something to say, if I follow this and I measure these things, we're on the right track and we're going to see business growth, then short-term just feels a lot more reliable to fight for. You know, it feels more tangible. I ran an ad. I saw people come in, you know, I ran a promo for, you know, a discount on pizza and then my pizza place got more people this weekend. That felt more real than putting out necessarily brand awareness, which feels fluffy and vague. Uh, I don't feel that impact in the short term. I don't know how to measure it in the long term. So I, I think it's it's more an issue of people don't have the right tool sets uh, to think about it. And if they knew the power of long term and how much more effective the long term is, and we're going to talk through some really tangible things here. Uh, then it's it's really hard to to think and, and fight for long term uh, brand building when short term just feels more uh, tangible for them. Yeah. If there's no other questions uh, beyond that, Paul, I'll just, I'll keep rolling. Yeah, let her rip. Cool. Yeah, I'm wary of the time. Cool. So this is a very cool study by uh, Nielsen Catalina Solutions. Uh, Cantor also did uh, a study like this. Uh, there was a study of over 500 campaigns across all media. This is across all verticals, so not just manufacturing like my own expertise. Uh, this is B2C, B2B, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they tried to figure out if when you pull apart uh, marketing campaigns, what were the most impactful elements, the recipe for the cake, what were the most impactful elements to success? What variables made the campaigns succeed? And so in 47% uh, of the impact was based on the creative. Uh, so the creative being the video imagery and the text on it, the copy, uh, all of that was kind of under the same hood of creative. Uh, media, which I'll break down here in a second, and brand size. So if you're selling, uh, you know, a Coke adjacent, uh, let's say sparkling soda drink or whatever, <laughs> and you're selling something that's very similar to Coca-Cola, uh, you could run a equally as good creative campaign 
and still perform worse than than Coke because of just how much bigger they are. Brand size does impact success. So if you're if you're advertising as a small business and you're you're up against somebody who's more known than you, uh, and or has more budget to do the reach side, which we'll I'll break down the media uh, there in a second. Yeah, you're gonna have a harder time beating them and in the market. But what is really encouraging about this is almost fifty percent of the success comes down to the creative. And that's the three criteria I just talked about, by the way. So if you have better creative than your competitors, it's okay if you don't have quite as much budget or you aren't as big of a brand, you still can win. And the nice thing is, as I look at the market through this filter that I've been I've been talking through of what makes good advertising, most businesses are not creating good creative. <laughs> it may be really engaging, but it doesn't hit the, the brand criteria or the linkage criteria or whatever. Maybe it's not reaching the right people. If you can do these things right, you can beat brands with more budget or bigger than you. Uh, media is broken down into uh, the context. You know, when did they see the ad? Targeting? Did you get how accurate are you in making sure that you're hitting your best fit customer with your ad? Uh, recency? How uh, recently did they see an ad, and how did that influence their purchasing? And then reach? Did it actually? How many people within your market? Let's say your market is 100,000 people. How many people did you actually get in front of with your advertising? Um, yeah. So a, a huge piece that I look at in the beginning is that initial criteria of the, the creative. But also just like how many people are really reaching? I know a lot of local businesses, and I'm not trying to say organic social media doesn't have its place, but a lot of local businesses see, you know, I'm doing organic social media, I am marketing. Analyze how many people you're actually reaching and whether they're even your target audience. And you realize there's just so much growth potential in just making sure that you move from zero to one with your with your best fit customer. Cool. All right, moving on. So for marketing to be effective, you must target everybody or as many as you can within your your target market while short-term cash flow is absolutely critical for business operations focusing advertising efforts solely on capturing current current buying intent has very harsh diminishing returns there's a limited amount of demand in the market at any given time for your solution no matter if that's a soft drink or a shoe or a five million dollar storage solution the vast majority of your best fit customers are not in market right now and are not looking to buy Limiting your focus to purely in-market buyers uh, runs the risk of you spending paid media on buyers who have already made up their mind and are not going to go with you or would have purchased from you anyway. This is part of the reason why if you spend all of your money only on, let's say, paid search uh, or for you know Google search or only run it for retargeting, uh, like running advertising for people who have already been to your website, that data will look great in platform, but you may be spending on people who would have purchased from you anyway or have already made up their mind and we're never going to purchase from you and we're looking at your brand out of due diligence. I know a lot of uh, buying decisions in B2B is they'll have two brands that they are going to think about, that they're going to recommend, but then they're, they're, they're brief in terms of bringing it to the rest of the decision-making team is they have to pick five brands. Well, they're going to add three brands and you just might be one of them. So you really need to reach everybody. And I'm going to show you, I'm going to prove it here with a couple uh, graphics. So how many of your buyers are in market right now? I'm going to assume that your product is bought every five years on average, which is pretty common for um, certain kinds of clothing brands, uh, for manufacturing, like I said, um, heating solutions, plumbing and heating. Uh, yeah, anyway, I, I have no idea how diverse the crowd is here, but let's just assume your the product cycle, or sorry, uh, the sales cycle, the, the uh, yeah, yeah, product cycle, purchase cycle, that's the word I was looking for, is, is bought every five years on average. Not everyone buys at the same time, right? Not everyone's buying year one, so we'll stagger that out. So the thought experiment here means that 20% will buy over the year, 20% of that whole, 5% will be in market to buy every quarter, and only 2% of your total market that you're trying to hit will be in market at any given month. Uh, I saw a hand. I'll pause here. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Um, just wondering, because you're talking about uh, buyers that are in market over a period of five years. Can you also talk briefly about when your target audience is buying on a daily, weekly, monthly basis? In my industry, our customers buy weekly and monthly in larger volumes. Um, so how would we target, target someone or even seasonal? A lot of our customers are farmers. Uh, and would yeah. buy on a monthly basis. Can you give me a little more uh, details on uh, like why would they be buying weekly or something? I just need to know a little bit more about the product. So we're, we're a bulk fuel uh, supplier yeah, based in Winnipeg and Alberta. Uh, 
Um, so we sell bulk fuel to farmers, you know, construction companies, and other industries where they need, you know, five, ten, twenty, fifty thousand liters of fuel. Cool, cool, cool. So okay. So in your instance, I would think about when is when are they making another buying decision around the fuel? So it may actually not be every week that they're reevaluating every brand that could that could supply them bulk fuel. They may only make the decision to say, we're going to go with a different supplier, a different problem solver for us every one year, every two years, every whatever. Maybe it's it's completely uh, cost dependent because, you know, fuel costs will fluctuate. And then maybe they'll, it's because of a, you know, it's more of a commodity relation to it that they'll they'll reevaluate once a year or something. It really depends on the business. But what you need to think about is when, how often do they think about which solution are they going to go with, right? And, you know, if you're a bar, I know this, this, there might be a pub owner uh, on the call here. Maybe they're thinking about it every month. They're thinking, you know, which pub should we go to this weekend? Maybe it's every four weeks. Um, the percentage here is not necessarily a hard rule. It's a heuristic. It's a, it's a good way to think about your advertising is realizing that a very small percentage are making a decision today. Not everyone buys at the same time. I mean, to stagger that out. And so your your purchase cycle may not be a five years on average, um, but but don't base it on how often the person purchases, but based on how often they make a decision about a brand, right? Uh, so for instance, like a Netflix subscription, how often are people are reevaluating whether they need to have Netflix versus Amazon Prime? It's not every month necessarily. Um, so that understanding that purchase cycle is what we're looking at here. Uh, another, is there another question? I want to be careful that I'm not <laughs> dragging my feet too much. There's more content to get through here, but. There's another yeah, question. I'll, I'll take it. You could you could keep moving ahead, and then if uh, anyone else has questions, we'll save them for the end if we have time, or they could just you know reach out to you directly at the end if uh, you know we're we're losing time. But uh, feel free to keep uh, keep moving on here. Cool. Okay. So this is the general heuristic we're looking at. Two percent of your uh, buyers are in market in any given month. So targeting the whole market, your whole market, your best fit customer, really matters. 95% of your ideal prospects aren't in market to buy. And I've actually seen scenarios where it's more like 99% aren't in market to buy. Um, but focusing your, uh, regardless of your ratio, focusing your marketing only on in market buyers severely limits your growth and doesn't aid future cash flow, right? Where if you market to everybody, even those that aren't ready to purchase today, tomorrow, this month, this quarter, even this year, it does impact future cash flow. This is because when buyers do eventually enter the market, it really matters who they consider first. Being known before buyers enter the market gives you an unfair advantage. Close to 40% of B2B buying decisions end up in no decision. That's a uh, uh, research done by Gartner. 80% of B2B buyers have a set of vendors in mind before they do any research. That set, by the way, is usually one to two brands. I have a website issue. I have a supply chain issue, whatever. They usually have two brands they're thinking about. 80% of them have a set of vendors in mind before they do any research at all. And 90% will choose a vendor from their day one list. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Partially because they have familiarity, they understand the brand, that feels very clear to them. Partially because of risk mitigation. These I know these guys are big. I know of them. I've worked with them before or seen their pitch before. Um, it feels less risky than going with a brand I don't know. Um, part of it's just that psychological piece of familiarity and brand affinity. Uh, but yeah, no, it really, really, really matters that when they enter the market with a problem that you or who they think about first, and this is not just in B2B, the studies from B2B, so I'm being very clear about that. Um, but that matters for everything. I mean, if, if you're the pub, uh, uh, on the weekend that if you're not one of the first two suggestions out of the mouth before the family chooses where they go for the weekend, uh, to whatever pub, uh, or, or dinner, going out for dinner or whatever, you're very unlikely you're going to win out even if you get seen in their Google search or Google Maps looking at local restaurants, right? So it really does matter to be seen uh, before people enter their buying decision. And that means the cost of not being considered day one is very high. If 95% of your ideal prospects aren't in market to buy, only 5% are. Of the 5%, only 5% of them will choose a brand they found during the research phase and not one they were already thinking about from the, in their day one consideration set. Does that make sense? I'm combining the two studies together here. If 95% are out of market, only 5% are in market to make a decision right now, only 5% of the 5% are 
are going to pick outside their day one consideration set. And this is way, it's very important. It, the more expensive and complex your decision is, but it's really important to any brand ever. If you're not being thought about, you're not being evaluated, there's no chance to win the sale. So to be more effective, we must move from a zero to a day one consideration with your market. To reliably grow in business, you must advertise to people who aren't in market right now in a way that resonates with them and that they'll remember. Becoming known by your best fit customers and building brand affinity so that when they do enter the market, your brand is the one they associate with their category, with their entry points to your category. Building this mental availability takes time and consistency, but moving from zero to one gives you a tangible competitive advantage, right? It starts you essentially a lap ahead of other brands that will be fighting for that purchase. And that really comes down to then how do we measure this impact? This is so important. And this is this is really how brands grow. How on earth, on earth do we measure this? And we're gonna take a look at ROI here. Uh, but this is, if there's one thing you pull away from this conversation is do this well and fight to do this. Even if you don't have the tools in house or the expertise to measure this, if you are fighting and contending uh, and creating advertising and creative that, that speaks to everybody in your market, not just those who are ready to make a decision today, your brand will grow much, uh, uh, much more likely that your brand will grow and that your marketing will be much more effective. So let's look at ROI. People like to talk about ROI a lot in marketing, return on investment or return on ad spend. It's not a very reliable metric. It's not something you can measure very easily. And often the measurements that I've seen are flat wrong. So this is how it's typically measured. Um, marketing ROI is typically calculated using this period's marketing costs against the period's net new revenue or customer lifetime value. Uh, lifetime value is also something I, I fight a lot because you can't assume just because in the past customers spent maybe purchased 10 times, they'll, they'll purchase that in the future. We have no idea what the future will hold, right? It's much like investing in the stock market. Like, you can't look at the past and say, you know, this stock went up 55%. I'm going to keep investing in it, and that will be the, that'll be the same in the future. Otherwise, we'd all be uh, retired already. Uh, so this is, how it's, this is how it's normally measured. Sales uh, minus marketing cost over marketing cost, and you'll get like a three or something. You know, for every $1 we spend, we get three back. But this isn't a very accurate way of, of calculating ROI, and I'll show you here. Issue number one, current period marketing is going to impact future revenue. The impact of your current period's marketing efforts last way beyond the current quarter, especially if you're continuing to run it, even if the greatest impact is noticed in the current period, right? Remember, most people are not in market to make a decision right now. So they'll see your advertising efforts, whether you're at trade show, uh, digital advertising, an event you ran, whatever it is, but they won't act on it because they weren't ready. But hopefully they remember it, right, based on our criteria. Only a fraction of, of marketing costs can be counted towards current period revenue. That means when you measure ROI, then your marketing is way is understated because it'll do more for your business in the future. Issue number two, prior period marketing impacts current revenue. So not all revenue generated this period can be attributed to what you're doing right now in marketing. Past efforts, what you did last year, year before that even sometimes, uh, or at the very least last couple quarters impact current revenue. So this means when you calculate your number using the current ways, your marketing ROI is overstated uh, because your past work is doing a lot of legwork. And this is what this looks like. There's a third issue here. We'll get to it. But this is this is the visual to maybe bring it home. So if we pretend we're in that red highlighted or orange highlighted area, today's revenue is a combination of your baseline sales, what was going to happen anyway, even without marketing, and your marketing efforts over multiple quarters. So, you know, Year one, year one, quarter one, we do something. Quarter two, we do something. Quarter three, we do something. We get to quarter four, we run something. And we're like, wow, what you did this quarter was amazing. You know, what do we do, guys? We should, you know, do a TED talk about how we grew the business by 500% based on this really easy marketing trick. Well, as you look at it, actually, you're you are actually being impacted not just by this quarter's efforts, but the last three quarters have been impacting the people who are coming to market right now and are making buying decisions. So it'd be silly to, to calculate it or give all the credit to what you're doing right now, right? Everything in the last three quarters has impacted those in market today and the decision they're going to make. And moving forward, that will also be the case, right? Looking to the next couple quarters. Past marketing continues to have an impact on the present. And the third issue, and this is the biggest issue I have with it, is marketing can only impact incremental revenue. So what do I mean by that? So not all revenue is in fast, in, yeah, sorry, influenced by your marketing efforts. There's other things that influence someone's purchases, decision, especially the bigger your brand is. That means only incremental revenue above your baseline can be attributed to marketing. So calculating ROI using total revenue significantly overstates marketing's contribution. 
If you have a dealer-based model or retail, you're in retail stores, there's going to be a lot of sales that you get that have nothing to do with what you did in marketing. In this way, your marketing ROI is way overstated because you're just taking it uh, credit for everything that happened this quarter. It really needs to be something like this, where the gray line is your baseline sale. This would mean if we turned off marketing today, these sales would have happened. Then there's the total revenue, what actually happened, and then there's the difference between them. And the difference between them is what we call an incremental revenue lift due to marketing. It's what, would, what happened because of the marketing efforts. The gray is what would have happened anyway. And so if you're doing things like measuring ROI on a very simple campaign or using return on ad spend to see if your digital marketing is working, it's not factoring in any of this. And it's often taking more credit than it's due uh, because, uh, yeah, people are know about you before this quarter and it's in, impacting today's results. <clears throat> To measure marketing, we must understand incrementality. For a better look at incremental uh, revenue, you need to be able to use control groups. Uh, incrementality is the difference between the baseline sales and actual sales where advertising was present. So it's this would be an, a, a better model, would be uh, marketing influenced sales over baseline sales. This is much easier to put in a you know, simple little <laughs> math equation than it is to measure in real life. I understand that. And the smaller your business is, the less access you have to, to sophisticated tools um, to measure this properly. But also know this incrementality problem really is a, a bigger problem the bigger your business is, right? If you're Coke, a lot of your marketing efforts are going to cannibalize each other and take credit for everything because your brand is huge. If you're a local artisan shop selling pottery in Winnipeg and this is your first marketing campaign, You'll probably have very high incrementality. It'll make a big difference on your sales because you have nothing else going on. And the biggest thing you can focus on right now is to move from zero to one. So if you're like, oh my gosh, I've had my team focus on ROI and that's a lie now. <laughs> this is going to be a hard thing for you to measure, this, this incremental lift. But things that I would look at in the short term, when you're a, a, a smaller business or you're growing in your sophistication, um, is how's our year-over-year our -year sales? Are we going up and to the right? Are we seeing more sales this quarter than last quarter? Are we seeing more sales this quarter than qu this quarter last year? Um, do more people know who we are? Uh, I'll get there in a second. Um, I would run a brand lift study. If, if you're spending, you know, 100,000 in marketing efforts uh, or more, you can start to look at uh, brand lift studies. If you're doing 10 million a year, which probably nobody on this call is, in advertising uh, a year, you can probably look at sales lift studies. But I would probably just focus on Understand tying your marketing uh, and grounded in your actual business results. Don't get caught up in the small numbers like click through rate and uh, you know uh, cost per click and you know whatever conversions your platforms are taking credit for. You can use those to optimize your campaigns and see which ones are doing performing better within the little vacuum that you know Facebook advertising is versus paid search or whatever. Um, but I would just ground your marketing and is my business growing? Am I reaching enough people? Does my advertising fit this? you know, criteria. Uh, do more people know about us this year than last year? Um, customers coming back to us. Uh, those questions are what I would ask. And are we spending uh, less than we're making in terms of profitability? Uh, those questions are way more important for us before you figure out if incre incrementality is something you need to worry about. All right, just a summary, and then we'll leave it to questions and, and whatnot. So effective marketing builds mental availability with your entire marketing, mark your entire market, sorry. Mental availability is the superpower of marketing. Very little of our audience is in market to buy at any given time. We must spend the majority of our time, funds, and focus, and I would say even gearing our creative to influence future cash flow. We need to speak as in our advertising and the way that we talk to the world as if they're not in market because the vast majority aren't. So we need to talk to them assuming that they're not. Um, our highest goal we can have in marketing is to move from zero to one, fight to be known, liked and trusted and recalled by your audience, your best fit customers, so that when they enter the market, you gain an unfair advantage. Mental availability with your best fit customer is your superpower for business growth. And marketing effectiveness must be measured through understanding incremental growth, not just total sales or whatever your platform is telling you. Cool. That's us. Kind of heady. Awesome. Uh Awesome presentation there, Drew. Um, great take. Uh, lots of juicy uh, facts, stats, and charts, which is I'm sure everyone appreciates. 
Uh, we got a question already here um, from Greg. How uh, how do you establish the baseline sales? So uh, baseline stale, uh, sales isn't a very static number either. If we think about it, right? There's a lot of variables that's going to help you understand if your business or that's going to help you succeed uh, year over year with your business, like distribution, that physical availability piece, the price. Is your product better than other solutions they're evaluating, right? So there's a lot of things built into baseline sales, but the simplest way to understand your baseline sales is turn off your marketing. <laughs> turn turn off whatever marketing efforts you're doing, especially as the, I would say if you're going to turn off anything, that because that would probably sound scary to most businesses, uh, and it should, uh, is to turn off everything you have near the 10-yard line. And so what I mean by that is like the remarketing you're running or retargeting you're running for people who come to your website, um, your paid search. Uh, for people who are coming to your website or your branded search, and then you show up as a sponsored click on paid search. Anything you have near the 10-yard line that's very sales-focused, I would turn off and turn it off for, for a long enough time to see uh, is there a significant uh, drop in your uh, in your sales. Knowing that answer gives you more confident that you're spending in the right places, uh, and you probably realize that you're probably overspending in the short term, and you should be focusing on the long term. Good stuff. Uh, we got a hand up here uh, from Michael. If you, you want to come off mute, feel free to ask away. Hi, right, thank you very much. Uh, really enjoyed the conversation. Two questions, please. One, um, with the documents that you're putting up for us to view, I'm finding the conversation to be just as important. With the uh, shared information that will be sent to us, will this conversation be included as well as the documents that you're presenting is the first question. And then the second question I have, is that uh, represent a plastics company that does OEM production to the major construction and agricultural companies like John Deere, Cat, Bueller, um, MacDon, Linamar. Um, we do very little when it comes to uh, social media. Uh, our website is antiquated and we're looking at building it, what would be your recommended first steps to build product awareness and get in front of those buyers? Thank you. Uh, first off, uh, I'll answer the first question. So Michael, you will get a recording of the session and it will also be uh, put up onto our YouTube channel where you can also get access to all other sorts of webinars that uh, that we put on. Um, and yeah, and then Drew, yeah, if you want to take, take away the rest there. It sounds like he was asking how do I, uh, what's a good start, starting place? He does very little social media work or advertising for his business. What's a good start knowing that his uh, target market is very niche and uh, there are very few people that would make sense to reach with advertising? Um, the first step I would do is, uh, I come into a lot of businesses and that usually is the first question. I work almost predominantly or almost exclusively with niche manufacturers with very small audiences of who fits their product. And so I, I take a very similar approach to this, where we take a look at who is the best fit customer, how do they currently find you, and then understanding where these people are uh, in, the, in terms of the decisions they make and work backwards. Remember that is, just as much as you are a B2B business, you're still marketing to humans. There's still people with normal desk jobs, and you are uh, trying to reach out to them, the human in them, not to some corporate business. And most business decisions are... Uh, as logical as they are, there's a lot of emotion attached to it. So you still are trying to connect with the human being on either side of that. So uh, very practically, uh, I would I would take a look at where these people go to find answers. Um, do they search online? Do they look on social media? Are there groups are they part of? Masterminds, trade shows, and start there. And then also very practically, like LinkedIn has really good data on businesses in terms of business insights. You can get their emails. You can get um, whether they're on LinkedIn or not. And that database or any other database, Apollo, Zoom Info or whatever, you can use to then advertise to them directly. Whether that be on Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever, LinkedIn has an overlap of like 80%. If someone's on LinkedIn, they're 80% likely also to be on Facebook too. So don't think just because you're B2B, you need to be on LinkedIn. And uh, and get those e emails, figure out whether that's a group of 10,000 people or 100,000 people or three people and figure out how to get in front of them. And that's really what good advertising is. It's not really uh, partial to any one channel. So I'm going to take the very literal definition of effective and by effective advertising, meaning uh, from a scientific perspective, it has led brands to grow. 
Um, and so effective advertising often looks like the brand, ha when they did it, they increased in market share, more people knew of them, and then thought of them when they made a purchasing decision, thus causing them to grow. So I'm going to take that as the definition of effective. Uh, and knowing that, uh, it's pretty studied actually that TV is actually a very good effective advertising platform. It's just expensive for most companies and obviously very dependent on whether your audience is there, depending on which connected TV solution you're looking at, whether it be uh, ads uh, in between shows or on an ad platform or whatever subscribed channel they're onto, like, I don't know, a sports channel or something. So it really does come down to which audience you're trying to impact and get in front of. But TV is a form of effective advertising often because it gets the attention that other forms don't. Um, in terms of traditional media, billboards are actually really good. If you can pick a really good road, because uh, a, a, a billboard with great creative gets seen. And that's often how effective advertising gets evaluated. It's like the, the, the very bar basic level. Does it get consumed? Does it get noticed by your ideal audience? And everything else comes down to whatever creative works in the medium. But outside of social media, I would say billboards. Um, I've seen uh, traditional media like printed flyers be really effective for certain brands. Uh, TV, though, like I said, it's expensive. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, there, there are a myriad of ways you can get in front of your people. It just comes down to what's the best way to get in front of them in a way that they'll actually see it and digest it, like they'll pay attention to yeah. it and it'll resonate with them and they'll remember it. And then what's what's the best way you can get in front of as many of them as possible? There's a reason why people always gravitate to social media is because in social media, you're essentially paying for CPM, cost per mil, cost per 1,000 sets of eyeballs that see your stuff. And that cost is usually quite low compared to other advertising mediums. So sure. there's a reason why people do that, because the, the barrier of entry to good advertising or effective advertising is you're reaching enough people that you can even make a business impact. So uh, yeah, I, I would take a look at all that, all your advertising through that lens. If I created this and assuming my creative is good, are people going to enough people going to see it that I can make a business impact? And are they going to pay attention to it? Is there going to be enough attention to to create some sort of a memory there? So. OK, yeah, so lots of my talk today was much more around businesses that have hit the awkward teenage stage or are entering mid market. They have a little bit of budget. Um, they have cash flow. They have kind of reoccurring revenue every year, maybe a baseline sales. They're starting to have a customer base of people that consider them as an option. Startups, you're in a different situation. You can't focus as much as you'd like to on long-term cash flow because you need to, you know, survive to the end of the quarter or whatever. And so every startup's a little different. But for marketing strategy, I would probably start at the 10-yard line and work backwards um, to make sure that you're you're helping and aiding sales in the short term, right? The nice thing about being a startup is you also have smaller goals probably <laughs> than a big company where a big company has to grow, you know, if they're going to grow three to five, 10% this year, that's millions and millions of dollars. Where a startup, maybe you just need 10 more sales, 20 more sales or whatever. So although you have less resources to work with, you also have smaller goals uh, to, to fulfill and as a startup. So I would probably start with just try to, like, like I said, there's about 5% of your market in market right now. 95% who are not, I would try to create an inexpensive way as possible to reach as much of your market as you can, but focusing your energy mostly on short-term cash flow because of your constraints. You don't have the luxury of spending all of your cash on future cash flow. You have to focus on those in market that you can divert to you. And it's okay knowing that maybe only 5% of the 5% will choose you. It's okay because you don't have that big of goals yet. So stay lean. Get efficient, focus on the really like that core criteria of reaching enough of the people you can with the budget to allow attention, branding, linkage. And uh, and uh, the nice thing is, is also it's easier to measure too because you have nothing, you don't have past customers, you don't have historical business data, you don't have business size that's starting to dilute the numbers. Any sales that come in are probably well earned from your sales and marketing engine and the community you're building or the awareness you've you've generated. So uh, don't worry too much about about uh, you know sophisticated measurement, or don't worry too much about going long. Uh, focus on your your go to market strategy, understanding who the product is best served for, who will who's who will pay for it because the value is there for them. Uh, be there, keep showing up, and uh, try to do it as lean as possible, maximizing for reach. Yep. Regardless of where these businesses go, there's a, there was a wide variety of businesses that attended this call. The most important thing that I think uh, hopefully 
we left with is that we're starting to ask the right questions of marketing and of your team yeah. and of your skill sets. This shouldn't be a, now I know I clearly have to do A or B. This should be, what is my marketing doing? Does What role does it have within my business? And are we measuring it based off that role or basis of off what some marketing guru is saying online that I should be doing or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. You know, set the right goals for your marketing, um, measure it in a way that uh, towards the thing that it's actually doing and then make sure make sure that you know it's aligned with where your business is heading. You know, if your business is clearly focusing on this market, what can marketing do to aid that? How well do you actually know your customer and those who are not your customers yet? And where are they? <laughs> where do they spend their time? How do they make their decisions? And if you can answer those questions, you'll create better uh, marketing and overall more effective advertising.